half of all American adults say they sometimes get their news from social media. At the same time, almost two-thirds say they view social media as a bad thing for democracy. Which raises the question, what responsibility do social media companies bear for our divided political climate? Judy Woodruff explores that question as part of her ongoing series, America at a Crossroads. Social media was my sad little life. I was a, you know, far right, radical, crazy young person who was a jerk. My personality was not pleasant. Less than a decade ago, Katie McHugh was a prominent figure in the online world of far right extremism. She was a writer and editor at the deeply conservative publication Breitbart, where she was especially known for her vitriolic tweets. Whenever I was saying the really vile racist things that went viral, you find other right wing people on social media, on Twitter, and you, if you follow each other, you boost each other, and then the network just expands. And you say outlandish things to push the conversation that way. So you have this, the real-time interaction, real-time radicalization. McHugh has since rejected the far right. Today, she worries about her address being revealed, which is why we agreed to interview her in this hotel room. Some of her viral tweets are still well known. I'm quoting, funny how Europeans assimilated, unlike third worlders, demanding welfare while raping, killing Americans. Yes, that's what we believed. They're taking our money, our taxes. People of color will rape the white women. He wrote, it's important to keep families together. We must deport anchor babies along with their illegal alien parents. Yes, the dehumanizing language I was using. They are alien and they are dangerous and they are existential threat. That's what you believe on the right. And that's what you believed at the time. That's what I believed at the time, yes, strongly. And then the day came when you tweeted this, there would be no deadly terror attacks in the UK if Muslims didn't live there. Yes, and that was the tweet that got me fired and that was one of the best things that ever happened to me to get me out of that environment. Most of the things we try to do to discourage this tiny group of people who ruin the internet have very limited impact. Chris Bale is the founder of Duke University's Polarization Lab. His research focuses on how social media can be a driver of and a solution to political divisions. He says posts like McHugh's get outsized attention. When we look at people who are highly politically active on Twitter, we find that about 70% of the content about politics is generated by just 6% of people. And those 6% of people are disproportionately very liberal or very conservative. And so when we wander onto social media, we can wrongly conclude that everyone is extreme and everyone is sort of out to get everyone else. Contrary to popular belief, Bale says, the problem is not so-called echo chambers, online bubbles where people only have their views reinforced. We recruited a large group of Republicans and Democrats who were using Twitter. And we thought, hey, if we could just show them some messages from the other side, that surely they would come to realize that there are two sides to every story. Unfortunately, what we found at that time was that exposing people to the other side made them a little more polarized, not less. Which is fascinating because that's been the common assumption. Think about the last time that you saw a message from people you don't agree with. Did it produce a kind of calm, rational deliberation about whether the idea had merit, or did it make you mad? Bale says the incentive structure on social media platforms leads to more extreme content rising to the top as algorithms promote what gets high engagement, reactions, comments, and shares. We've made it all but impossible for people to gain um, status for sharing and voicing the moderate views that many of us think our country needs right now. I have seen a one too many post talking negatively, namely about like black women. So I'm like, okay, this is when we turn this off. Taylin Harp is a mental health counselor in Raleigh, North Carolina, with expertise in serving people of color and members of the LGBTQ community. She struggles with what she sees online. 
if there is a lot of negative comments being made about black women, if there's a lot of negative commentary being made about the LGBTQ community, it's one of those things where I'm disconnecting, I'm blocking those pages so that I am not constantly being fed with that. But she says social media has also helped her connect with her community anything having to do with black indigenous people of color and also LGBTQ rights, different things happening within the LGBT community. That's really where my focus comes to on social media. I do remain an optimist that on balance, the technology, the developments that we will see will make our lives better. Matt Peralt was the head of global policy development at Facebook until 2019. He's now the director of the University of North Carolina's Center on Technology Policy, which receives funding from Facebook's parent company, Meta, among others. I was never in a meeting where someone said, here's something that we could do that's good for the world. And here's another appro approach that's going to be good for our bottom line, that's going to make us money. And people said, let's just do the money approach and not the good for the world approach. Is there an inherent conflict here in, you have, these are for-profit companies uh, that want to grow audience, they want to increase engagement, and what their mission is, is not always going to be consistent with promoting accurate information. I agree with, with, with what you're hinting at in your question, that that isn't necessarily aligned with the public good. It might not be good for the world if it's a more connected world. That I think is a good rationale for smart regulation of the tech industry where there are those kinds of market failures that produce harms. I asked him about Meta's decision to reinstate former President Trump after he had been banned for praising people involved in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. It is not clear to me that censorship um, results in stronger outcomes down the road. President Trump didn't disappear just because his content wasn't hosted on Meta. He started his own social network. He has lots of followers on that social network and he posts there regularly. There's the truth and those are your, your opinion. And so people have muddied that. Becky Lou Hobbs chairs the Wake County, North Carolina chapter of the conservative advocacy group Moms for Liberty. She says she's gotten hateful messages online after her group called for removing school library books that include descriptions of sex or discussions of gender identity. There's a difference between not liking a statement I make and making somebody angry versus somebody wishing harm, death on you, a family member. I mean, is it your sense that um, the people in charge of content with these different social media platforms should do a better job of policing themselves, monitoring themselves? It gets really slippery when some bot or programmer tries to determine without true thought what is offensive and what is not. That's not a free platform. At the end of the day, these are businesses, these are corporations. And even though many of us don't like the fact that corporations are now in charge of democracy's public square, it's de facto what has happened. Bale's polarization lab has begun to develop tools they think could reduce conflict online, including an AI powered assistant. Last year, Nextdoor, um, the social media platform that allows neighbors to connect to each other, came to us and they said, we've got a lot of toxic language going on. How can we identify solutions that are both good for society and profitable? Bale's team helped Nextdoor employ AI to suggest less divisive language to its users. And this resulted in a 15% decrease in the use of toxic language on their platform. So these are real solutions that are low-hanging fruit that I think could be implemented with minimal cost to social media companies. So you're saying these are things that companies would have to be persuaded uh, would frankly raise revenue, right? I mean, Yes, I do think they, of course, they care about revenue. You know, they're beholden to shareholders. Much as I might not like that, and you know, many people might not like that, that is the reality. These social media platforms, they're disincentivized from cutting down on right-wing rhetoric because, again, it's a moneymaker. It's a huge moneymaker. Racism is very profitable. To help her work through her own painful experience, Katie McHugh reached out to counselors who help individuals leave hate groups and move beyond extremism. I was very lucky and blessed to have people who I trusted completely help me extricate myself. 
um, from everything. And I described it as pulling shrapnel out of your brain. What I believed was vile, and I didn't want to be that person anymore. Having that community in place stops and diffuses so much of the hatred because a lot of the online isolation will cause that. There are a lot of angry people in our country, and one way to understand what social media does is it gives those people more of a platform. And I worry that if we you know, point all the blame at social media and don't do a little bit of introspection, that we'll be unhappy with the result. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Judy Woodruff in Durham, North Carolina.